All right, folks, so today I want to look at a paper by Leslie Lampert, which was written back in 1978. And the question that this paper deals with is how to keep time in a distributed system. If you're not already familiar with this, I'd encourage you to pause and ponder this question on your own before we dive into the rest of the paper. Now, Lampert was awarded the Turing Award back in 2013 for his fundamental contributions to both the theory and practice of distributed systems. This paper looks at how we can analyze the ordering of events in a distributed system. And once we have a theory to deal with that, how we can use that to solve synchronization problems in distributed systems. The last third of the paper deals with physical clocks, and I won't be covering that in this video to keep it short. What is a distributed system? A distributed system is a collection of processes which are separated in space and which can communicate with each other only by exchanging messages. This could be processes on separate computers, or it could even be multiple processes within the same computer. A defining characteristic is that the delay of transmitting a message is not negligible compared to the time between events within a single process. There is a fundamental limitation when it comes to ordering events in a distributed system. And that is that sometimes it is simply not possible to tell if one event occurred before another one. So if you take the complete set of events within a distributed system, we can only at best define a partial ordering within those events. Our intuitive understanding of ordering of events is naturally associated with the time at which events occur. However, in a distributed system, we cannot count on physical clocks, even if the computers themselves do have physical clocks. And that is because two clocks on two different systems can never be perfectly synchronized. There will always, in reality, be some drift between any two physical clocks. So Lampert in the rest of this paper ignores physical time when it comes to ordering events within a distributed system and only looks at events observable within the system. Now, what are these observable events? Primarily, they are the sending and receiving of messages. To start with, we are assuming that a single process is completely sequential in that we can take all the events within a single process and totally order them. We know the exact sequence in which those events occurred within that process. An event is simply the sending or receiving of a message. And now we can define a partial ordering on the events of a distributed system denoted by this arrow symbol. And the definition is pretty straightforward. If we have two events, A and B, within the same process, and A comes before B, then A arrow B, which you can read as A happened before B. So that's the simple case within a single process. Now, when two processes are communicating with each other, A is the sending of a message, and B is the receipt of that message by another process, then we define A as happening before B. And lastly, we have this transitive property which says if A happened before B and B happened before C, then A happened before C as well. And since this is a partial ordering, it could very well happen that for two events A and B, neither happened before the other. We simply cannot tell by looking at the observable events in the system. And in that case, we call A and B to have happened concurrently. It's helpful to look at a simple example. If you look at this diagram, each line denotes a process. So we have process P, Q, and R, and each dot on the line denotes an event within the process. These wiggly lines denote messages being sent between processes. And given this kind of representation, we can see that an event A happened before another event B. If you can start from A and draw a line 
either along communication or process lines from A to B. So let's look at an example in this diagram. Let's try to relate P1 and R4. And we can say that P1 happened before R4 because P1 sent a message to Q, and that was event Q2. We move forward in time within the process Q. We send a message to process R, which was received over here at R3, and then move forward in time to reach R4. In other words, we are able to draw a line using only process and communication between P1 and R4, and hence, P1 happened before R4. To take another example, look at P3 and R4. You can draw no such line between P3 and R4. Just by looking at the observable events in the system, we cannot tell whether P3 happened before R4 or not. This definition of happens before makes a lot of sense because we can see that A happening before is the same as saying that A can have some sort of causal effect on event B. And conversely, two events are concurrent if they cannot causally affect one another. Lampert relates this back to Einstein's general theory of relativity, where events are ordered in terms of messages that could possibly be sent. However, here Lampert is taking a more practical approach and only ordering events based on messages that are actually sent. All right, so now that we have defined a partial ordering on the events within a distributed system, we can look at how to define a logical clock. And all that a logical clock is, is a way of assigning a number to an event where that number can be thought of as the time at which the event occurred. And the notation we use here is CI of an event A is the number assigned to the event A in the ith process within our distributed system. And we should stress one more time that these numbers are purely logical. They do not have any relationship to physical time. What condition do we want our logical clocks to satisfy for them to make sense? One very elementary condition is that if A happens before B, then the logical time of A should be lesser than the logical time of B. And how should we relate back that condition to the happens before partial ordering that we just defined? This is pretty straightforward. If A and B are events within a single process and A comes before B, then we want the clock of A to be less than the clock of B. And if A is the sending of a message and B is the receipt of that same message, then we want the clock of A to be less than the clock of B. So given these conditions that we need to satisfy, how can we define a clock function? Within a process, we can do this pretty easily. We simply increment the process's own clock as we go from event to event forward in time. Now, how do we maintain the clock when we send messages? If we send a message with timestamp clock of A, if process J receives that message, we want to set the clock of process J greater than or equal to its present value and greater than the timestamp of the message it just received. If we satisfy these two conditions, then we have a correct system of logical clocks within our distributed system. So now we have a partial ordering of the events within a distributed system, and we have a way to assign numbers to those events such that we can construct logical clocks out of them. So how can we now define a total ordering on these events? We can do that by simply ordering the events by the times at which they occur, where the time is defined by the logical clocks we just defined. And then to break ties, we simply pick an arbitrary total ordering. It is possible for events to be concurrent with each other where we cannot tell if one happened before the other. So we cannot define a unique total ordering within a distributed system. 
what the author is defining here is simply an arbitrary way to break ties to come up with a total ordering. And why are we even doing this? We want to define this total ordering so that we can use it to solve the mutual exclusion problem. Now, this is the classic problem of distributed systems where we have a collection of processes which share a single resource with the constraint that only one process can use the resource at a time. So if more than one process needs this resource, the processes must communicate and synchronize amongst themselves to avoid a conflict in accessing this resource. In order to solve this problem, the author makes two important assumptions about the network that carries these messages. The first one is that messages are never reordered. They are always received in the same order that they were sent and also that every message is eventually received. The way this algorithm is going to work is that every process is going to have its own request queue. And the initial condition is that the process P0 is the one holding the resource at the beginning. And the request queues of all the processes contain the message T0 colon P0 which is a way of saying that process P0 requested the resource at time T0. And we're also going to assume that T0 is less than all the clock values. And now we will run the following five rules on every process. If process PI wants to request the resource, it will send the message saying timestamp TM colon PI request resource to every other process and also put that message on its own request queue. When another process receives this message, it's going to put this message on its own request queue and send a timestamp acknowledgement back to the requesting process PI. Now, if PI is the one actually holding the resource and it wants to release it, it will first of all remove any request messages for the resource from its own request queue. And then it will send a message to every other process saying that PI is releasing this resource. And then when another process PJ receives this message where PI just released the resource, it goes and looks in its queue and removes all messages where PI was requesting the resource. So we have those four rules which define how processes send each other messages when they want to request the resource and when they want to release the resource. And then we have this fifth rule which defines when a process is actually granted the resource. So the process PI looks in its own request queue. And if there is a message in its queue for requesting the resource at timestamp TM, and this timestamp TM is ordered before any other request in its queue by the total ordering that we defined before, and PI has received a message from all other processes that is timestamped later than the timestamp of the request. If these two conditions are met, then the process PI can be safely granted this resource. The important thing to notice about this is that it is a truly distributed algorithm. There is no central process or central coordinator which is making decisions about these processes. Each process is independently following these five rules and as a side effect of following these rules, it is able to safely get access to this shared resource. The only shortcoming of this algorithm is that it assumes that all the processes do not fail. Even if one process within the distributed system fails, then this algorithm will not work. Okay, so to recap, we defined the notion of happens before for events within a distributed system. 
and this gives a partial ordering of those events. We then use the partial ordering to define a somewhat arbitrary total ordering. And once we had the total ordering, we could use that to provide a solution to the mutual exclusion problem in a distributed system. So that was Leslie Lampard's paper on clocks within a distributed system. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.